Hi, I'm Greg Olick with Metacoustics, and today we're going to talk about the AudioScan Verifit 2. It's a brand new product that um, was developed over the last few years and came out in maybe the third or fourth quarter of last, last year, 2014. It's, it replaces the original Verifit, which you see here, uh, which had become the standard of the industry for real ear measurement, uh, for fitting of hearing aids on pediatric patients up to one, down to one month old, and it also became the standard of the industry, at least in North America, for uh, hearing aid analysis, like a hearing aid analyzer that would be used in a, uh, in a clinical setting to measure things like battery drain, the, res the gain or response of a hearing aid, um, and those types of things. And I'll, I'll show you all of those applications. Before we start the in-service training on the uh, use of the Verifit 2, let me just explain a few things about it and how it is different than the original Verifit. It does everything that the original Verifit did, and it has some more enhanced features as well. Um, this is the original Verifit that many of you will be familiar with. Some, some, of, some of the people viewing this, this session will be Verifit users who are upgrading and now going to be using, for one reason or another, the Verifit 2. So you'll see the differences. So I'll talk about them some. And I know there are people that are viewing this session that are using this device, Verifit 2, for the first time, and they have not used the original Verifit before that. There was also a portable version. It's called the RM500SL. That a, was a portable version of the Verifit, and that still exists. And then this, the company, AudioScan, also has like a little brother to the Verifit called the Axiom. It has the most critical of the functions, especially all the real ear measurement functions, and it's got a few test box functions, um, and that's a, uh, a less expensive, less full-featured um, version of the Verifit that they call the Axiom, right, so that they can fit all budgets of different types of, of practices. I want to okay. talk to you just a couple, spend a couple of slides talking about uh, the reasons to do real ear measurement. This is important to talk about as we start talking about this product because this should be the main function of the product. And as probably everybody listening to this session knows, not everybody who dispenses hearing aids, not everybody fitting a hearing aid on a patient, be it pediatric or adult, and especially adult, uses real ear measurement. There are some that are true believers, and they feel that real ear measurement should be used on every patient, regardless of who it is or what the situation is, to get the optimum performance on that patient, so that patient would have the optimum benefit of it. And others uh, are non-believers altogether. They never use it and say they don't need it. They do just fine with the fitting software. And then there are others that are somewhere in between. They use it only on pediatrics or only on special adult cases. Uh, and the reasons some people claim is that it's too time consuming. And if you're using this type of device for the first time, then you might say it took me more time to do this than it did if I wasn't doing it. More time to fit my hearing aid because I had an extra process. Um, however, users that are the true believers that have been using it this type of thing for years and are very familiar with it, they really don't spend any extra time on it. They, are, they put the probes on the patient, put the tubes in the ears, the hearing aid in, all of that very, very quickly. I mean, within seconds, uh, and they do it properly. And um, actually what it does is end up saving them time in the long run because the main time consuming thing would be patient maybe coming back and complaining about something with the hearing aid. 
and it is proven through several studies that when real ear measurement is used and used properly, then the amount of return visits to readjust the hearing aid gets cut down and sometimes uh, eliminated. And so in the long run, it wouldn't be time consuming. And even that day of the fitting, uh, once a person is used to using this, where it's second nature, automatic to them, then they, the time really is not an issue. Too difficult? Well, in the beginning, when these things first came out, I, and I was sometime in the 1980s, I can't remember exactly what year it was, maybe the mid 80s, 86 or 87 maybe, um, and it might have been that the software at the time was uh, which was actually DOS drip based, was uh, on a difficult side. But today, these things are extremely user friendly. No one can say too difficult. Another thing that I hear sometimes is that hearing aid manufacturer, the, the actual manufacturer of the hearing instrument, said, you don't need to do it on this equipment. Uh, how, however, that, that really is not a substantial argument. My next slide will prove that to you. Um, then the last thing that some people say, well, it's too expensive. Well, there are a, a wide range of, of pricing of these things. The least expensive one in existence is made by a company called Medrex, M-E-D-R-X. And uh, they're located in Florida. Uh, and I think their systems start at right at around $3,000 or $3,500. And then it goes up to the Verifit, which is around 13000 So with all of that range of prices, the excuse or reason that it's too expensive, it basically doesn't make sense either. And this slide will demonstrate why one really needs to make a real ear measurement to know what they have and feel confident that the patient is getting the maximum benefit. This simply shows the results of a research study in 2006 where the, the lab was comparing the amount of gain available in the ear of a patient when the hearing aids were fit with the manufacturer's first fit software. Okay. Now they were comparing these to the NAL target. Okay. So what NAL, the National Acoustics Lab, would say is the necessary gain to um, allow soft speech to be audible, average speech to be comfortable, right? We would need a gain like this. Here's the target for this particular hearing loss. All right, well, all of these plots that you see in here are different manufacturers and their so-called first fit. And as you can see, they do, some of them do fine in the lower frequencies, but fall way short on making speech uh, properly audible and understandable at the high frequencies. And that's very, very typical. In fact, the average is this red plot here. And uh, you can see that basically they don't. And the true believers became true believers in real ear measurement because they started doing it when they got the equipment, they started doing it on every hearing aid. Instead of just certain cases, they started doing it on every fitting. And when they did, this is typically what they will say they found out. They found out that in one third of their cases, the response in the ear to soft speech and average speech, and maybe loud sounds as well, was what they wanted it to be. Soft speech was audible at all frequencies, including the high frequencies. Average speech was comfortable, and uh, loud sounds were not uncomfortable to the patient. And so they're happy. And they said, I don't need to touch a thing. This is a good fit. But in two-thirds of the cases, they were disappointed at the first fit, as one would be with these. And they decided, well, I'm going to have to tweak this because even though the patient may say to you, oh, it sounds fine, I'm not making important parts of speech, in particular consonant sounds, audible, and even 
uh, with surf, soft speech and sometimes even with average speech, not making it audible. And um, so they would use this to, uh, to tweak the adjustment from what the manufacturer had recommended. And they say to themselves, if I had let the patient walk out the door, as I did before I started making the measurement, then um, they might be psychologically and emotionally happy with this, but they're not receiving the um, auditory input that they should have. Their, their performance with this hearing aid is not as good as it should be or certainly could be. Okay? So anyway, that's the argument. And so now let me just introduce to you the Verifit 2, the new generation of Verifit instrument. As you can see, it has two pieces, or maybe you can't tell by this, but two pieces. It has the piece that sits in the back that sits upright like this with a nice, um, large, high-resolution color, color display. These are the speakers for the uh, on-the-ear, real-ear measurement, and then there is a, a test box there. There's no keyboard on it. It is operated by a, uh, a wireless mouse, which comes with it and there's no printer in it. The printing would be done, you could, can plug into this, almost any HP or Hewlett Packard printer and it will print out in color, a nice full page report. Or of course you can send the, uh, the results of this test to NOAA and it's, it would then be a, uh, a session in NOAA that you could at any time call up and, and, and look at and of course print it out if you wanted to. Another thing about this is the test box part is very much improved. It's improved in several ways. One particular way is the test box on the original Verifit was not very uh, acoustically sound as far as its noise reduction. So you had to be pretty quiet in your environment if you were doing anything inside of that box because otherwise it would interfere with the responses that you were getting. But that's not the case anymore. Uh, this is instead of plastic metal uh, and it has excellent uh, noise reduction characteristics and um, as well as the other acoustic characteristics that are necessary inside. Okay? So that's a, that's a big improvement. So let me just show you a couple of things. If you're used to the original Verifit, things that will be different, things that actually make it better, things they learned about the design uh, by, by actually having that instrument on the market for over 10 years. And during those 10 years, they made constant updates to the software. And at one point, they made a complete update to the hardware even. Uh, well, as I said before, this is wireless mouse driven. So you'd use a mouse to, to drive it and make your selections entirely. There's no keyboard on it, as was on the old unit. Um, and when it first boots up, and any time you right-click on the mouse, this menu pops up. And it's the only menu. There's only one menu versus several menus and sub-menus that were on the original Verifit. So one click gets you anywhere, a right click to pop up this menu and then one click on there to make any selection, whether it's measurements that are made on the ear or measurements that are made in the test box or, or changing from right to left ear, printing, um, saving or um, deleting a session to start another patient um, and even set up if, if, if you're doing an initial setup. Okay, so that makes it faster right there because it's, it's one click brings you everywhere. No intermediate menus whatsoever, just one. Another thing that people, uh, s some users of the original Verifit, and in fact all real ear measurement equipment complain about, it's not a big thing, but there's too many wires because they already have a collection of wires which are cables to connect a high pro or some type of pro, pro programming device to the hearing aid. Well, and then you have the real ear probes as well. And, and so they tried to just make things neater. For, for one, there is a module like this and both probes can sit in holders 
the right one and the left one, can sit in holders on the probe module. And there's one cable going from that module to the, uh, the rear unit. And that, there's a clip on that so you can cl clip it on the patient's clothing. And another thing is what to do with the probes when, <clears throat> when you're not testing a patient. And some people put hooks on the sides of the, of the verifits, plastic glue-on hooks, because it gave them a place to put the probes. Well, the probes mount in this module, and then the module can uh, actually has a magnetic connector. So on either side of the rear part of the verifit, you can just snap that on, and it's easily stored like that. When it's on the patient, it's like this, and it's very neat because there's one cable going from it to the, to the instrument, and then there's two sh uh, shorter cables that actually go up to the probes. And in fact, this thing, I don't know what they call that, they have a name for it, but that slides up and down and holds the two wires that go to the probes. And it ends up holding the probes if you just, after you've got the probes in the tubes in the ear and the probes are on the ear, hearing aids in and everything, just, just slide that up in between the two wires like this, almost to the patient's chin. Then it holds the probes flat against the patient's uh, jawbone. And this way, they don't flip around. The, the reference microphone should be on the outside rather than the inside. And it should be flat like this rather than turned around uh, towards the front or worse, towards the, the rear. So, so that's an improvement too. Just small things, but they're really helpful in the real world. Here's a close-up look at the probe. Someone who's used the old Verifit will see that the probes are different. They're a little smaller, a little bit lighter, uh, very easy to use, very comfortable, very easy to mount on any patient and make the proper adjustments, get the tube in the ear, okay? And um, the distance of the patient from the instrument is not really critical. Though I tell users, if they're doing actual real ear measurement on the ear, to have the patient as close as is comfortable to the instrument. It's just better signal-to-noise ratio that way. But it's not critical, the distance. You don't have to measure the distance or anything like that. And this is what the screen on the, the new system looks like for real ear measurement. And there are some things on here that are just plain nice. Okay. Um, now, those of you who have been using the Verifit before um, are familiar with this. This is called speech mapping. And what, um, what they've done here is they've entered the audiogram or pulled it right out of NOAA. Okay? And NOAA might have been fed by an audiometer that was um, NOAA-driven audiometer on a network. But regardless of how you got it, there's the left ear audiogram in the dark blue. And whatever is below it is not audible. Whatever is above it is audible. And this shaded area that you see here is the unaided speech banana. And you can just press one button uh, on here, and you can either display that or not display that. It's good to display for the purpose of counseling because you're telling the patient, here's your audiogram. Now, it had been converted from HL to SPL sound pressure level, not hearing lo level. And so um, whatever is below it is not audible. Whatever is above it is audible. Up here is too loud. This represents the UCL, uncomfortable loudness level. So you see that the unaided speech banana is here. This is speech that is unaided, and it is essentially, for this patient, not audible. All right? So you wouldn't have to do anything but show that and you graphically demonstrate how the patient certainly needs some type of hearing device. And then once they've actually made a, uh, a fitting, in this case, it was at 65 dB. In other words, that, that represents average speech intensity uh, or level. And notice that uh, the amplified speech banana is this area here. Maybe it's pink or purple, whatever it is. Uh, and, and now speech went from not audible to audible and comfortable. 
The center line there is what's called the LTAS, long-term average speech spectrum. The upper edge of it is the peaks of amplified speech in the ear, and the lower edge are the valleys of amplified speech in the ear. The, this middle one, the thicker one, is the L test, the average. And you could, you could hit a button on here and also remove that, so all there is is the L test, if you want it. But a lot of people like to see the whole thing. Got peaks, valleys, and average. And um, of course you want that to be audible. And, um, and then you, you also want it to be comfortable. Not right at threshold level, or else it's barely audible, and certainly nowhere near this, which is uncomfortable for the patient. Okay? So that just gives you an idea of what the screen looks like. And on this one screen, this is a screen that's used to operate this when it's in the real ear measurement mode, all of the things that you might uh, be selecting, like choosing what type of hearing aid is it, BTE, CIC, uh, or is it an open fit? Or what type of hearing aid is selectable here? Um, and whether you want it to just use the average UCL or you want to put your measured UCLs in. Uh, whether you want it to use the average RECD, real ear to coupler difference, or put your own measured RECD in there. Um, and then whether you are uh, any, anything else that you have to put in, you can, you can do it right from here. You don't have an extra outside menu for it, okay? Here you select um, whether you're just viewing one hearing aid or whether you'd like to view them both side by side. Uh, whether you want a graph or a table, and you usually want a graph rather than a table full of numbers. And then the age of your patient, is it an adult? Uh, or is it a child? And if it's a child, what is the age? And you have norms for children from one month old to 10 years old in one month increments. And of course, that's based on a, uh, major studies that have been done by the University of Western Ontario, which is just down the street from AudioScan. <laughs> um, and, um, uh, and they've been doing it so long on so many thousands of children that they have excellent, excellent norms. Uh, what type of transducer was used for the hearing test, whether it's an audio, uh, an earphone or an insert or a speaker, and uh, things like that. So this is an improvement too, in that these selections, which are made on each hearing aid before the measurements are made, can be done right on the same screen instead of having an outside menu. Okay? There's also an improved hearing loss simulator. You can choose a number of different things, an average conversation taking place, uh, a child speaking, uh, a telephone ringing, birds singing, things like that, just to demonstrate to normal hearing individuals that come with the hearing impaired patient the need for a hearing aid. Okay? What you see here, for example, is a conversation that's taking place uh, maybe in a medical office. Uh, between a patient and um, someone at the desk there. And if this was the patient's hearing loss, this is the threshold of normal hearing, and then this conversation is shown here. They would hear the conversation in a normal, average uh, intensity, and they would actually see it here, and they would see the need for the hearing aid because here's their uh, their hearing impaired relative, father, mother, whatever, um, th that, um, that has this hearing loss and not deaf, there's a little bit of speech that they hear, but they certainly think that this person is mumbling because um, a large amount of the components of speech, especially consonant sounds, are missing. So you can see that and demonstrate it very, very well. And this is a, an algorithm that really represents properly a sensory neural hearing loss. So they can listen to this conversation take place in a normal world and then hear it, press one button, and they hear it the way the patient 
hears it and they can experience the hearing loss. And it's when, when people use this to say, boy, that is much better than other hearing loss simulators, just simple ones that they maybe have from a manufacturer's software or something. It's a really, really good one with real good graphics, doing it in real time with real signals. Um, and I think you would appreciate that. So the bottom line is, ideally, this is a tool. The Verifit is a tool that should be used and certainly can be used in all of these applications. It's a, and that's why I have from alpha to omega, the beginning and end of the Greek alphabet. Um, it's used for everything that you do uh, with a patient when it has to do with the dispensing of hearing aids. For example, it's a sales tool. It's an excellent sales tool because one thing that has to be done in sales, um, in dispensing a hearing aid, is you have to actually sell it. You, you have to demonstrate to the patient and other people who may uh, be important to the patient, the spouse or children, something like that, the need, you have to demonstrate the need for a hearing aid, and then you have to demonstrate the benefit. And it's very easy to do this in a very visual, easy to understand way with this type of instrument, okay? So it's a sales tool. It's a demonstration tool because you're demonstrating the need, you're demonstrating the benefit. And uh, of course, it's a fitting and programming tool because you're using it to precisely uh, adjust the hearing aid beyond what the fitting software did automatically. So maybe it came close or whatever, but, or, or maybe you're disgusted at what it did, but it doesn't matter. You'll be able to see exactly what's needed and, and be able to apply that. For verification of a hearing aid that's already been fit, been adjusted, is it good, bad, or indifferent, this fitting? How much benefit is the patient actually receiving relative to what he needs? A counseling tool, because sometimes the the, the best that you can do as far as technology won't make the world perfect for this patient, right? Uh, and so it's a counseling tool to show, hey, here's what we've got. Here's the best we can do. And so you have to realize that and uh, take the appropriate actions. Uh, and a troubleshooting tool when things aren't right when the patient is telling you that they are not happy about the performance of the hearing aid one way or another. Well, it's a tool that you can actually see what's going on um, and pinpoint the, the cause of, of the, the patient's frustration and um, you know, will know how to uh, adjust that out, okay? So hopefully, as I show you this instrument, you'll see that all of these things are covered by uh, a piece of equipment like this. This is the screen, the main screen, and you'll see these as I operate it. And um, here we're, sh we're doing what they call a dual view. We can see the left and the right test results. And um, just to explain this, um, this is a real ear measurement. Whether it was done in the test box or on the patient, it can either be simulated real ear measurement in the test box, which you would do on practically all pediatrics, uh, or actual real ear measurement on the patient. Either way, it will look exactly the same. And you see that things that you need to input into the system about the hearing aid are uh, available right on this screen instead of in separate menus. And um, for, each, for each ear, you can you can measure up to four different responses. And it would be very typical to uh, use one that is soft speech, one that is average speech, and then one that is loud speech. And you might also do an MPO, maximum output level. What happens when the patient goes into a very loud environment? Uh, does the output exceed the uh, patient's comfortable level? And so that's what the user did here. This green curve was soft speech. Now this blue thing, that's, that's their actual hearing loss on the left ear, right? The blue curve here. So naturally what's under that is not audible. And so notice the, I don't know if you can see it, but there's little 
stars, they're the actual um, targets using the, um, the fitting formula that was selected. And we suggest NL1 for patients that are used to hearing aids. It's not their first time with a hearing aid. And then if it is a patient that is being fit with a hearing aid for the first time, maybe use NL2, uh, which, which gives less gain. And sometimes NL2 at soft speech, you say, boy, I'm not making those high frequencies audible. Uh, and, but for a first time wearer, um, the gains are low, okay? And, uh, and that's okay because you know that and once the patient has some experience with the hearing aid, um, you'll make changes to that. And then average speech, that's this, oh, well, I don't know if it's red or purple. Um, and, you, and you see here, other than the very high frequencies where the hearing aid rolled off, they have a pretty good response that is not right on the threshold because it's average speech, but it's comfortably above threshold. And then for loud, the average, the, the Soft speech was 55 dB, average speech 65 dB, that's conversational level. And then loud speech, someone is speaking up like I am now so you can hear me. Um, well, that, um, that's here in this light blue. And you see that's almost meeting target in the highs. And, and maybe if a user wanted to, they could um, tweak it up a little bit in the high frequencies to meet the target. But anyway, that would be a very nice result. This one this gold or golden one here is the MPO, maximum output level. And that was, um, that was with 85 or 90 dB bursts at one third of octaves. What happens when there's an expo exposure to loud sounds? Patient goes to work in the factory or whatever. Um, and, um, and now we wanna make sure that the maximum output level of the hearing aid is not gonna come anywhere near the UCL, uncomfortable loudness level for that patient, where I'll say, I can't wear it in this environment. A lot of compression comes in now. And so um, this turned out great because these black stars are the UCL. When I don't want to, I, I don't want to hit that or go over that. I want to be below that. I want loud sounds to be loud, but not uncomfortable. So you notice the targets. I hope you can see those little stars that are the same color as the response. And they are just below the patient's UCLs in black. And so the hearing aid did good at, at um, not exceeding those. Okay. If it's below those, that's fine in this case. So I could do up to four curves on both of them on this one screen. And, um, um, and so now it makes sense. This is the threshold of normal hearing way down here. This would be zero on the audiogram if we were plotting it in HL. But this is it in SPL, normal hearing. Here's the patient's hearing level. This is the dark blue um, audiogram that had been converted from HL to SPL. And now we have a, the green curve for soft speech and then average speech in the purple cu curve. The light blue is loud speech and then um, MPO, maximum power output, loud, loud environmental noise. And so th this, this would be a full display, I've done everything. Right? It would be what your final E would save. And all they saved was not the entire shaded area, but just the LTAS on these. And that's common, especially if you ran four curves like this, you wouldn't want the, the, the screen would be quite hard to, uh, to determine which is which if you included that shaded area. So you can include it or not include it. And there's certain curves. Some people, when they, they print their final report or they save it, they, they, they don't save all of these, just the one for average speech, uh, though each of them are important. And the fitting software of the manufacturer allows you to make different adjustments for soft sounds and louder sounds. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. So here's what is maybe new about the Verifit 2. I told you some things already, uh, but there are just a few more. One, it's a fully binaural system. In other words, you can do both ears at the same time in the test box. So anything you do in the test box, you can do uh, binaurally both ears running at the same time, okay? Um, 
and it is also high frequency. It's broader band. The Verifit in the past and all hearing aid test and real ear measurement systems have a response from about 100 hertz or 125 hertz to uh, 8 or 10,000 maximum. Okay. Uh, well, this has a response from 100 hertz through 16,000 hertz. So it measures high frequencies. It's a broader band. Uh, that's important with some of today's technology, and especially for younger patients, uh, that uh, broadband is used. Okay? And um, many of the instruments today are paired instruments. So they, they talk to one another. And so you really want to be able to test them simultaneously in the test box, have them both in there and both running simultaneously. Um, and so you can see the effect on both hearing aids of things. So it's the only real platform for that kind of paired device. Uh, and it's office ready and, e and faster than ever. What they mean by that is um, this system can be viewed and operated on your computer. In other words, if you have a computer that you're using for fitting, you have your fitting software on that, you might have NOAA on that, um, and um, you're going to run the fitting software on that, and you have the Verifit, you can use the Verifit as a standalone device. In other words, no computer necessary. It'll do everything on its own. You can also use it on, run it by your computer so that um, on the same screen that you have the fitting software, you can have the screen of the Verifit. That's what they mean by office ready and faster than ever. Um, so that you don't have to reach over and use a separate mouse to operate the Verifit. You can, you can operate it with on your computer, on your computer screen. You don't have to keep on looking back and forth between your computer screen, which would have the fitting software on it, and then the Verifit to see what the results are. So one mouse, one screen, uh, uh, and so that's, that's helpful. And that's not extra cost software. It comes with it. We install it all the time. And uh, uh, people really like that because it just makes it convenient, especially if the Verifit isn't located uh, right, right there where the uh, operator can see it easily. Okay. Um, it, um, it's also faster because and they say 50% faster because it has quick connect couplers. So you seldom anymore have to use putty to putty uh, to, to attach hearing aids to the couplers. I'm going to show you these in, in detail. This is what makes it's one, another thing that makes it uh, faster. And it has a, an adaptable setup. What they mean by that is if you use it the same way all the time, in other words, you do soft speech, you do average speech, you do loud speech, you do an MPO after that, and those are the measurements you typically make on an ear. Um, you might skip one where you don't do the loud speech, maybe you just do soft and average and leave it at that, even though it's nice to do that MPO just to be sure of the high end. Um, anyway, it remembers what you do. So the next time you turn it on, um, it's... It's the way that you do things. It adapts to the way you do things. So you don't have to each time make a bunch of changes to do it your way. It learns your way and adapts to it and makes that the default. Simple as that. Okay, there are some extra couplers in this that weren't in the original Verifit because of the wide band. Remember, our response is 100 to 16,000, uh, where before... It was only to eight or 10,000. So you have wideband couplers. They're a little bit different, but you have two wideband couplers, one for left, one for right, because you can do them both at the same time um, in the test box. And we also have the conventional ANSI couplers, the, the conventional HA1 and HA2 couplers, the behind the ear and the in the ear couplers that we always had. Okay, so you can do those, use those, or you can use the high band, uh, broadband, sorry. And here are the adapters 
that make it unnecessary to use putty. You can still use putty, so putty comes with it, okay? But most of the time, you will be able to use these. These two are called trick adapters, T-R-I-C, adapters. And of course, that stands for tr thin tube receiver in the canal. You would, this black rubber adapter would snap right onto any of these couplers and then the receiver that's in the canal would, there's a hole in the middle of it, and you'll see it in a minute because I'll show it to you mounted. And these are adapters that snap onto those couplers that you would use for a behind the ear hearing aid. And they have putty for it if you had custom ear molds. Naturally, you can't use an adapter for that because it's custom. You still use the putty. All right, so here we have uh, a hearing aid in the ANSI couplers. The ANSI couplers are blue. And if you're using them and just m and, and measuring things that, that follow ANSI specification, like hearing aid drain and things like that, uh, not hearing aid drain, uh, battery drain, then, then use that coupler. We use them all on the left side. I'll show you this in more detail in a minute. But you, the main point I wanted you to see is we have a, uh, a behind-the-ear receiver in the canal type of hearing aid here with this th thin tube. And you see we're not using cup, uh, putty. That was, that was a little bit annoying when we had to use putty for that. Uh, this is the reference microphone. Uh, here's the hearing aid. This is the receiver in the canal that's just plugged into the hole in that trick adapter. Okay. Notice that the coupler microphones are this whole device here, a couple of microphones. And there's two of them. There's a right and a left because we're going to hook up both hearing aids at the same time. And you can't see the right one because it's on the other side, but the left one has uh, a coupler on it and the trick adapter. Here's a, shot, a good shot of this, okay? Uh, here, both hearing aids are behind the ear, receiver in the canal uh, type hearing aids. The type of hearing aids you probably dis dispense most, and there's some practice that says, oh, they're all, we're, all of ours are these. Uh, well, they're very, both of them are mounted. There's little things to actually hold the hearing aids and uh, little clips and then both of the uh, wideband couplers have been snapped into place and with the trick adapters on both of them, and then they're both mounted in there. And I can do anything in the box on both of them, including uh, real air measurement, simulated real air measurement.